Okay, welcome everybody to Machine Learning 101. I'm David Rosenberg. I'm in the office of the CTO in the Data Science Group at Bloomberg. And this class is called Foundations of Machine Learning. The goal of the class is to lay the foundations for you guys to be real experts in data science, uh, practitioners, expert practitioners. And uh, this class, the first class today, for the first week, in fact, will be looking at the big picture of machine learning, primarily supervised machine learning, uh, and we'll be learning the tools to properly use all these great machine learning libraries that are available to us. And initially, we'll be treating all those machine learning algorithms in the libraries as black boxes. And we'll learn the, the proper way to use these, these algorithms in a machine learning pipeline, in a machine learning setting. But the next week, starting next week and for the rest of the course, we're going to be really diving in to the details, to the nuts and bolts of these machine learning algorithms. We're going to understand how they work at a mathematical level, at a computational level. We're going to try to understand all the relationships between different methods and really get a, as deep an understanding as we can. The understanding that we think will inform good practice. So we're not going to be kind of proving theorems about methods just for their own sake, just for curiosity. We're going to, we'll have some theory, but the theory will be chosen because we think it informs good practice. It gives insight, it gives intuition. And that's kind of how the material of the course was chosen. So, without further ado, the first topic of the course we're calling black box machine learning. Black box refers to the idea that you can do an awful lot of good machine learning, of good data science, without actually understanding how the core component, the core machine learning algorithm works. As long as you have all the pieces, all the pipelining, the infrastructure around it set up well and used well, you can, you can do some damage, some good stuff. Uh, but you could do much better if you understand the details, and that's the rest of the class. But for today, black box machine learning. Okay. So a brief sketch of our schedule for today. First, we'll talk about what is machine learning for, then what is machine learning? Then how do you do it? And finally, what can go wrong? And then we'll do a case study at the end where you guys can uh, kind of brainstorm an approach to an interesting machine learning problem. So machine learning problems. Common theme of machine learning problems is that we're given in some, some input x and want to produce some kind of appropriate output y. All right? That's the general structure. It's prediction. We'll start with a few canonical examples. We have here, this is perhaps everyone's favorite first example of a machine learning application, spam detection. An email comes in. That's the input, an email. The output is, of course, is this email spam or not? It has two possibilities, spam or not spam. So it's called binary classification. All right, that's the first, most common machine learning type of problem. Next, consider medical diagnosis. Input, an enumeration of symptoms that a patient has. Right? Nausea, fever, coughing. Output, one output a diagnosis. For simplicity, let's say there's only one diagnosis that would apply. So we have a large list of possible diagnoses, and the output would be the selection of one from that list. Now, with this being uh, multiple possible outputs. It's called multi-class classification. So medical diagnosis, you have your symptoms. It's unlikely that you'll be absolutely certain about a diagnosis, even an expert, not to, not to mention a, a machine learning system. And so you might want to express some uncertainty in your prediction. All right? um, maybe it's unclear whether it's a flu or a common cold. How do you express this uncertainty? So now what we have are called uh, soft classifications, uh, essentially probabilistic classifications. So what you'd be producing is a probability distribution over the possibilities. So probability of pneumonia, 0.7. Probability of flu, 0.2, et cetera. 
So that's soft classification. Soft refers to kind of your, it's a, it's a distribution over possibilities as opposed to a hard decision on what class is being selected. Next example, predicting a stock price. You have the history of a stock price up to today. You want to predict the stock price that closes the day tomorrow. All right. Key difference here from the previous setting is that we're predicting a number and not a class. Anytime you're predicting a number, it's called regression. All right. Regression means predicting a number. And of course, regression is, it goes far beyond kind of basic linear regression that you learn in statistics class. Regression can be an arbitrarily complicated computer program deciding what number to produce given your inputs. It's still regression. All right. So those are the core, the most common types of machine learning problems. And we'll spend most of our time focusing on those. So now let's get into a little bit more of the vocabulary that we're going to need. The first, arguably the most important, is called the prediction function. In some sense, the prediction function, making a prediction function is the ultimate goal of machine learning. The prediction function is the thing that actually takes the input x and produces the output y. Right? It's the thing that does the, solves the problem that you set out to solve. Machine learning is basically the way that we produce this prediction function. All right, so what is machine learning? First, let's start with what it's not. It's not rule-based. This is an alternative approach. So let's go back to the medical diagnosis case. Um, in a popular approach from the 80s called expert systems, you might start by consulting experts in the problem you're trying to address. You'd go to doctors. Uh, you'd go to reference material. You'd extract facts from reference material pertinent to medical diagnosis. All right? And you would try to represent the expert diagnosis procedure as a series of rules, like if-then statements. Right? And hopefully, if the rules are done well enough, they capture the knowledge and maybe the intuition of an expert making this same decision process. And the hope is to kind of duplicate the expert's decision-making uh, procedure. It doesn't really sound too bad to me, just to hear it. Um, so, but some things can go a little wrong with it. Now, to be fair, what I've just described, kind of expert systems, this really sells short the field of expert systems. There's a lot of sophistication in there. They have um, knowledge bases, and they build systems that know how to derive new knowledge and create new facts from old facts using logic and inference. Uh, so I don't want to say it's just a bunch of if-then statements, but uh, it captures the flavor. Now, with rule writing, we might have a procedure like this. So we'd start with the problem presentation. We'll, we'll think about the problem, uh, say medical diagnosis. And then we'd write some rules that capture our first round of research on how does one do medical diagnosis. And then we'd evaluate the performance of those rules on some data. We'd analyze the errors. We'd think some more. We'd write some more rules to fix the errors and iterate. Right? Eventually, we're satisfied with its performance, and we can deploy. That's kind of a rule writing uh, iteration cycle to solve a problem by, by writing rules. So what's the, what's the issue? One is it's very labor intensive to build. Someone's got to do the research. Someone has to write the rules. You have to talk to experts. They have to be able to express their process in kind of precise if-then statements. Um, also, and a bigger issue, is that the rules can't generalize to unforeseen combinations of inputs. If there wasn't a specific uh, encoding of how to handle a situation, it can and, in practice, often fails dramatically. So this was. This was the major, this is one of the major issues with this rule-based approach. They were considered to be fragile and uh, not reliable, not robust to deviations from expectation. Another issue is that they don't naturally handle uncertainty. Maybe you have observations, but they're not, 
they're not definite. It's like uh, there's a high probability that this particular uh, thing was present in the in the input, um, and ex it doesn't express certainty on the outputs. Just like we had probabilistic classification, that's not a natural thing for an expert system to produce a probabilistic uh, prediction. So. Yeah, please, a question or comment. Yeah, so, so this is a problem with machine learning systems too, right? So if, if my data is like, let's say, financial markets, which are like constantly changing, and I haven't seen a particular day in my training set, so that can be a problem for a machine learning system too. So the, the comment is that uh, kind of this inability to handle unseen situations would be potentially a problem for machine learning systems as well. Because, you know, it, for instance, in market prediction, every day is different. No day is the same, as, exactly the same as the last. And so how will we know what to do with the new day, given that we haven't seen exactly that before? Well, let's for now say that machine learning systems uh, tend to generalize better to unforeseen situations than the rules. Um, and moreover, if things do change in the world, uh, we'll see that it's easier to, or it's a different process to adjust the machine learning system than to adjust the rules. So let's come back to that in a few slides. So machine learning says, let's not try to reverse engineer the expert's decision-making process. Let's try to have the machine learn on its own. So how do we do that? The key ingredient is what's called training data. Training data, it's pairs of examples of inputs and outputs. The input x and the output y that we would like the prediction function to produce. And with the whole collection of these input-output pairs called training data, we would feed that to the machine learning algorithm. And the algorithm would attempt to generalize and understand the, infer for, on its own the rules by which it would produce a y given an x. So for example, a training data set could be a set of videos, and for each video, whether or not there's a cat in the video. It could be the set of emails, and whether each email is a spam or not spam. And that label, that label, whether the, which corresponds to the output y, was determined by an expert or a human, generally speaking. Okay. So learning this way is called supervised learning because the supervision is the person who has assigned an actual label to each of the inputs. Great. Now, to your question. Suppose we have a machine learning algorithm and it's been trained on some data, and then something changes in the world. We're seeing days like we haven't seen before. And maybe it's, it's failing to generalize. So what's the procedure in machine learning? Well, in that case, what you can do is take the new days and add those as more training data to our training set retrain, and hopefully it will now know how to generalize these new types of days that we're seeing. Conversely, for the expert system approach, if something changes in the world, someone has to go in and re-change rules, rewrite rules, maybe make new rules. Uh, so on the one hand, in machine learning, you update the training data. Maybe you have to throw out old training data if you think that it's no longer representing today's reality. Okay, um, That's kind of the machine learning update process. For the rules, someone has to go in and edit old rules or write new ones. But in either case, yeah, you can have issues with generalization. Empirically, machine learning tends to generalize much better. I think that's why people, that's why that has kind of won between the two. Great. So to recap, machine learning algorithm, its input is training data. So if you think of the algorithm as like a box, the input is training data, what would the output be? Say again? Prediction function, exactly. So the machine learning takes the training data as input and produces a whole function, the prediction function. Great. So the prediction function is what you'd actually deploy and you know, you'd send to engineering departments to put it on your systems and it's running and solving the problem that you intended to solve. Great. So here's our iteration process. I kind of described it uh, verbally for the machine learning approach. Whereas before, this box here was write some rules. 
Now it's been replaced with training machine learning algorithm. And the pieces are the data, the training data as input, and the method by which you're using machine learning to learn and build your prediction function. Right. Okay. So quick recap of what we've had so far, key concepts. We've had three machine learning problem types, classification, binary, multi-class, and regression. The classifications we had hard and soft. Right? Those are the most important three classes of machine learning. We have the prediction function. That's what actually solves the problem you want. It takes the input x, produces the output y. We have training data. That's the pairs of x, y that are fed to the machine learning algorithm. And then a supervised learning algorithm is what actually produces the prediction function. And machine learning will want to solve problems to say create prediction functions that take inputs of a wide variety of types. Text documents, time series, variable lengths, sound files, images, DNA sequences, logs of, of, of user usage on a computer terminal. All these things could be inputs for a prediction system. If someone has some data, someone probably wants it classified or ranked or scored in some way. So this all should be fair game for machine learning. So the issue is that machine learning algorithms really like to work with fixed arrays of numbers. Okay? So if you're a computer scientist, this is like an array of doubles of length d, right? If you're a mathematician, this is rd, right? a vector space, d-dimensional vector space. Right? This is the frame we'll be in more starting from next week. Right. So the process of mapping from your raw input to this fixed dimensional vector in rd, it's called feature extraction or featureization. So the raw input kind of doesn't have to have any structure. It could be arbitrary, on a computer it could be an arbitrary file, it could be a binary. It goes through a feature extraction process, it could be a program, and it produces a vector of D numbers, which represents in some way a single input, X. Featureization. Now, what I've written is phi of X, that's the feature representation of an input X, that's what gets fed into a prediction function um, into the machine learning algorithm as part of training data. So what do we want to say about features? So what makes a good feature? What makes a bad feature? And basically the idea is that anything that the machine learning algorithm has to work with to understand the pattern to map from x to y has to be encoded somehow in this featureization. And moreover, kind of the more of the important structure that you've extracted and exposed very clearly in the feature vector, the more, the more you've kind of solved the problem already in the feature vector, the, easy the job, easier the job of the machine learning algorithm is. Let's take an extreme example, right? Suppose someone has already written a prediction function to figure out what the right output is for given input x. Suppose you made the output of that prediction function the single feature in the feature vector, right? So in some sense, the featureization has already solved the problem. The best prediction function would just be the identity map. So that's an extreme case where the feature extraction is so good, you've already solved the problem, right? This is not the standard case, but um, this is where human expertise and intuition can help quite a bit in designing the features and um, as we learn more about the different machine learning algorithms, we'll understand that some algorithms handle certain types of features better than others. And for some machine learning algorithms, you're going to need to help them out a little bit more with more featureization. And for others, they won't care. Another term for feature vector is input vector, which is natural because it's the input to the, to the prediction function. All right. So let's, let's take an example task. Straightforward. Given a string, is this string a valid email address, yes or no? Now certainly this can be solved with rules, but let's think of a machine learning approach. So first, we have this input string, and we need to make a feature extractor for it. All right, 
Here's some examples. This is a five-dimensional feature vector. We can think of this as being an RD. One, two, three, four, five numbers. All right. We've given each of these entries a name to help us uh, talk about it. So the first entry in this feature vector, which is a one, is representing the answer to a question. It's representing the answer to the question, is the input string x having a length larger than 10? Is it longer than 10? One for yes, zero for no. The second feature, 0.85. This is answering the question, what fraction of these characters are alphabetic? Right. 0.85. The third, does the string contain an at sign? Yes or no, one or zero. Right. So we're able to represent information about the input string as a vector of number. Now note that no matter how long this input vector is, the input string is, we're going to have the same dimension of our featureization. Clear? All right. So this feels a little bit ad hoc, maybe. It is a bit. And can we, can we make it a little bit more systematic? And absolutely, we, we can and we should. And we'll come back to this more in a few weeks. But one notion is the notion of a feature template. So here, the idea is, the idea is you want to, in some sense, be as open-ended as possible in your feature generation. So for example, you, you might think it's a good idea to say, does this, does this email address end in com, or org, or net, or edu, right? But why not just in, make a feature for every possible three-letter suffix? Just include them all. Does it end with AAA? Does it end with AAB, AAC? All of them, right? Now, only one of these will be a one, and the rest will all be zero. There's a name for encodings like this. They're called one-hot encoding. Whenever you have a collection of features like this that kind of work together to encode a single thing, and only one of them will be active, and the rest are zero, it's called one-hot, one-hot encoding. OK. Um, so what do we gain here? We gain the fact that we don't have to brainstorm all the possible, we don't have to research all the possible endings to, a, to an email address. It's, um, if there's a new kind of domain that comes online, we don't have to change our feature set. We can just add some new training data. Right. Whereas with the previous method, if suddenly .000 became a, a valid domain, we would have to add a new feature to capture that. OK, one hot encoding. Uh, another term for you guys, categorical variable. A categorical variable is a variable that takes one of several discrete possible values. So gender, male, female, it's categorical. The New York City boroughs, categorical. And we can encode these using one hot encoding. So in statistics, you might have heard the terminology dummy encoding. Same idea, same thing. All right, so just a quick concept check. How many features will we need to one hot encode the boroughs, of which there are five? OK, four. And why four? The absence of any of them would be the other one. OK, so you might say, so you could do it with five, right? Is it Brooklyn, less you know? Is it Bronx, yes or no? And that would be a one hot encoding. And you're pointing out that four would suffice. Why? Because Suppose you left off Staten Island, and all the rest were zero. Well, then you know it has to be Staten Island. Great. So for some machine learning methods, it's actually not very many. But some traditional statistics methods, it's actually important. It's helpful to not be redundant, linearly redundant in your uh, representation. So then you'd want to use four. For most machine learning techniques, uh, five is fine as well. Easy concept check. A little bit more terminology for you guys. Label data. This refers to taking your feature vector. Now every, ex every row, this is kind of a little spreadsheet. Every row corresponds to a single example, right? a single x. So the first row, x, gets encoded into a d-dimensional feature vector. And then we've paired it with its correct output label, in this case, false. So this feature vector paired with the label, it's called a label datum. 
it's one example, one labeled example. And the collection of it, so in this case a trained data set of size 3, a labeled data set of size 3, altogether it's called labeled data. If you leave off the label, unlabeled data. We talk about both of these things a lot. All right. So, prediction function, now it's recast it in our new terminology. A prediction function will take as input a feature vector, representation of the input x. It'll output a label. Sometimes it goes by the name prediction, response. Starting next week, we're going to use a more general term, action, output. It's what the prediction function produces. And what a prediction function would do, it could take a representation of a lot of labeled uh, unlabeled examples and produce a corresponding vector of labels all at once, for example. That would be a prediction function acting on some unlabeled data. Okay. All right. A learning algorithm, again in our new terminology, we take as input labeled data and we produce a prediction function. So this black box, this purple box, this is the learning algorithm that takes the training data and produces the prediction function. So today's talk is, is trying to talk about everything except the internals of this box. The rest of, this, the, rest of the course will be diving deep into all the different things we could put into that learning algorithm box. Okay. Okay. So key concepts, feature extraction. It's what maps an input, an arbitrary input, into arrays of numeric values. And ideally, it's extracting all the most relevant and most useful information presented in a way that's as easy as possible for the machine learning algorithm to use. And what makes it easy or not, we'll understand more later. So one of the most important parts of machine learning, data science in general, is being able to evaluate what you've come up with, evaluate your prediction. Assess whether it's good or not, your prediction function. So, scenario. You have this brilliant data science intern. You've given them some data. They produce a prediction function for you. How do we evaluate the performance? So, the key ingredient, one key ingredient, is something called a loss function. So what a loss function does is it scores how far off a, a prediction is from the desired target output. All right? So loss, if you think of it as a function in, in math or computer science, it takes two arguments, the prediction and the target, and it returns a number called the loss. Um, big loss, bad. Small loss, not too bad. Zero loss, no error. This is the standard. Typically, zero loss is no error. So classic loss functions, we'll talk about these a lot more in a couple weeks. Standard loss functions are the zero, one loss. Did you get this particular class correct or not? It's for classification. Um, Multi-class or binary. And then regression loss, the most standard one I should have asked you guys is square loss. So I'm predicting a number. I predict five. The correct number is seven. I'm off by two. The square loss takes the difference and squares it. So my loss would be four. That's, that's the loss that's sitting inside standard statistics linear regression, square loss. All right. so this is a way to evaluate the performance of a single prediction on a single x. And then what we really want to evaluate is the performance of a prediction function overall. Why? We have this prediction function we've created using machine learning. We want to deploy it into the wild to actually serve customers or solve our problem. And we want to make sure that this prediction function is doing its job well kind of on average. So really what you might ask for is that the average performance of the prediction function across the examples, performance being the average loss of a prediction function across the examples is small, small loss. That's good performance. All right. So data science intern gives you a function, prediction function f of x, says that its average loss is, is 0 0.01 using classification loss. So it's a 1% error. Product manager says, we're good to go with this prediction function if it gets better than 2% error. So are we in good shape or are we not in good shape? It's a little bit of an issue. It depends, depends how well the data science intern did their job. But 
potentially the issue is that the report of being better than 1% is how the performance was on the data that was used to train. Now, if you build your model using a certain set of data and then you evaluate the performance on the same data, this is exactly like testing somebody on problems that they've already done for homework. Right? They've seen already the answers to uh, these questions. Now, they may not have remembered them all, so they may still not get it perfect, but this is not a good evaluation on how it's going to do on new data in the wild. We want to test how it does on new inputs. So the standard approach here is to have what's called a test set. You take your original full data set, and you hold back a piece of it called a test set that's independent of the training data. So you have your data. Your intern shows up. You carve out some fraction, let's say 20% of, of your data as test data. You keep that. Then you give the rest to your intern. Intern can go to town, do any kind of machine learning, or not machine learning. They can do anything they want with that data. They can ignore the data. Somehow or another, by hook or by crook, they produce a prediction function that they claim is useful, is worthwhile, is worth your consideration. You say, thank you, I'll take a look. You take that prediction function, and then you run it on the test data that the intern has never seen. The performance on that test data should be, if all is good in the world, a good estimate of how this prediction function would actually perform if you deployed it into the wild. So to recap, the training set the training set is what's used for building the model, the machine learning algorithm. The test set is only used to assess the performance of the prediction function that's finally decided on. And the performance assessment is to decide, is this prediction function good enough to deploy? Have we, is it going to perform how we need it to perform? That's the purpose of the test set. It's the only purpose of the test set. So how big a test set? It's a trade-off, isn't it? Because the larger the test set, the more accurate your performance assessment is. If you have five examples, it's not going to be a very accurate assessment of probability of getting the classification correct. If it's huge, you'll have potentially a very precise estimate. On the other hand, if you have a huge test set and a small training set, it's going to be harder to find the good prediction function. So for small data sets, there's a bit of a trade-off between how big your test set should be. So, this split in the train and test is actually really important, and it's actually quite subtle. So we're going we're gonna to dig into it a bit. So the first distinction I like to make is between the train test scenario and what I will call the train deploy scenario. I don't think that's standard terminology. The train deploy scenario is what you're eventually getting for. You take all your data. You feed it all into your machine learning algorithm. It produces a prediction function, and then you deploy it into the wild. That's train deploy. Train test is supposed to be a simulation of train deploy. So in train test, we do our 80% training set, 20% test set. We get the performance estimate on the test set. That's the whole training test scenario. In train deploy, I said first, you build the model on the label data, you deploy your model into the wild, and you hope for the best, basically. And the hope is that this train test setup is such a good simulation of the train deploy setup that the performance you get on the test data is a good prediction of the performance you're going to get on the model deployed in the wild. Right? So the closer that these two match, the better shape you're in. So a big part of real world machine learning is ensuring that your test performance is a good estimate of your deployment performance. It's like train test should be a full dress rehearsal with all everything on, all the tech equipment there, everything as realistic as possible as when you're actually deploying. Right? That's, that's the optimal. Okay. So how can we do this and how can this process go awry? We'll think about it a bit now. So first of all, um, splitting your data. So I proposed randomly hold out 20% of your data. So for a test, first of all, why random? Why would random be important? 
Why not arbitrary? Why not just let someone pick however they want to? Unbiased. Yeah, so we want the, some, some unbiased selection of the test set. Uh, so let's, let's be specific. What could, suppose for instance, uh, you have your training data, your label data, and someone along the way sorted the data by one of the features. Maybe, maybe this is demographic information. Someone sorted the data by state. Right? And maybe you take the first 80% of the entries in this training data as, as test. As, tr as train and the last 20% as test. Well, this is really lousy because all the states that show up in test are probably not going to be in training. Maybe a few overlap. So that, that's, 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 that's bad. Why? Because training needs to represent your test set just like test needs to represent your deployment set. So a safe bet in most situations is take your training data set and randomly split it. Okay, but let's consider time series prediction, right? Time series prediction problem, let's say you have 1,000 days of historical data, and you're going to do something like take all the data up to a certain point in time and predict what's happening uh, a certain number of days into the future, five days into the future, say, or more. You could, maybe that's part of the prediction function. You take how many days into the future you want to predict. All right. So would random splitting of days into train and test be a good approach in this scenario? No. What do you have in mind? What do you think? Because you can't predict uh, past based on the future. So the concern is that you, you might be in the scenario where you're predicting the past based on the future. I agree. So let's, let's get to that by thinking in terms of the train deploy scenario and the train test scenario. So train deploy. The prediction function, so suppose here's today. All the historical data is that way. We took all that data, and that was our training data for our machine learning algorithm. It produced a prediction function, and now we're deploying it on future data. All right. So one thing that for sure has happened is the prediction function was built based on data that happened historically. All right, so that's the train deploy scenario. Now suppose that we have the train test scenario with the random day splitting. So as we go over the days, we have train, 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 test. Train, test, test, train, train, test. Okay? So the days are randomly alternating. So here's a test day, and we use all the training days to predict this test day, but the training days, some happened before and some happened after, which does not resemble the train deploy scenario. So immediately, the fact that train test does not resemble what's happening at train deploy, okay. So the proper thing to do, of course, is you, you take your, your timeline and you pick a point in time t to split on, and anything before it is the training set and anything after it is test. All right, great. So that's... That's train test split for a time series scenario. And you may find other new interesting situations where the a random train test split doesn't quite make sense. And how do you decide what to do? You always have to go back to the first principle. Am I making my train test split resemble as closely as possible and in as many aspects as possible the train deploy scenario? And that will guide you. That will be your guiding principle in perhaps inventing a new way to split into train and test. So, summary about what to give your data science intern. You split your data into train and test. You give the training set to the intern. You keep the test. Intern gives you the prediction function. You evaluate it on the test set. And if all is well in the world, if you set everything up well, nothing changes in the world, then the performance on the test set will be predictive of the performance on the deployment set in deployment, which is basically one of the most important aspects of practical machine learning. Yeah, question. So after you do a train test on the evaluated performance, don't you want to train on the everything and, and before you deploy the production? Great. So the question is, um, we've done this train on the training data, and then we evaluate it on the test set. 
But before we deploy, don't we want to use all of our training, all of our data, and build a model on all the data? Why leave out some test data that we could use for training before we deploy? Is that the question? Well, that's also the answer. That's right. Before you actually deploy, you'll build a new model using your training data and your test data together, because why not use more data? You'll get better results. And then you deploy that. So the hope, generally the truism, is that using more data makes things work better. So what you expect is that performance on your test set will be, um, will be even improved upon, hopefully, by the performance of the model that was trained on training and test and then deployed. Yeah. yeah. Question. Don't you have the concern that now we initially had a model that was only of the training data and then we verified its accuracy to some extent by testing it. Now you have a new model. How do you make sure that this new model is not overfitted to the whole thing and is so, uh, it, it might improve performance on the test data because it's also trained on that. But how do you verify that it's not so different from the original model that you Okay, so the question is a good question. Um, we question is a good question, and then we actually haven't gotten to how to answer that yet. So you've trained a you, you've produced a prediction function somehow, and then you evaluated it in a very unbiased way on your fresh test set, and that gives us confidence that we if we use that exact training the exact prediction function in deployment, we'll know how it will perform. And now you're saying, somehow you're coming up with a new prediction function, and you're not running it on any test set, and you're just deploying it. And how do we know, why do we think it's going to do better? How do we know it hasn't overfit? And so to get confidence in that, you have to really look into the details of what's happening. And the idea is that you fix your method of going from training data to prediction function, and use the exact same method on the slightly larger training set where you've added the test set into the training set. And we have every reason to believe that the performance will only get better with more training data, as long as everything else is held fixed. Good question. Yeah, so the fact that we want to say the incorporate the test data in large data set will produce better uh, performance of the eventual uh, deployment model is based on the fact that they are the same, we assume they are the same characteristic between the training data and the test data. For the time series, you just uh, give an example, um, that would that be still true? Because if, for example, if I have a, I have a you know, model that depends on the, five, the fact that it doesn't have a scheme change in the time series. If it doesn't have a scheme change, I'm moving fine. And it can happen that uh, for the training set and test set, they don't, they are, they, there is no scheme change. But if I combine them, because they are actually two different schemes, okay. the, the whole thing will, you know, will quite different from. Yeah, them. okay, great question. So if I understand correctly, the question, the comment is that, suppose there's something that's happening here and maybe something you're saying something might change in the test period. Okay. And then we, so we get our performance in the test period. And because things change, we're probably not going to do that great. We wouldn't have done as great if we had maybe tested here, because you say things changed in the test. Um, so we're going to get a performance measure. And then I'm proposing that you retrain on the whole train and test set combined. And now you're incorporating data that's kind of a little bit different in this time period than the earlier time period. Yeah, the basic thing you say is incorporate that will increase, basically assume that these two have the same kind of similar characteristic. Yes, by randomization, you basically, you know, it's one way to achieve that. But this is definitely not a random uh, choice here. So combine them may not generate the same, from a statistical point of view, the same. Well, okay, so I, I agree that the, may, you may expect the performance of the combined to be different than the, for, do you think it will be better, or do you think it will be worse? Quite different. You don't think you don't want to take a stand on yes. better or worse? No, I don't want to say quite different. Means that invalidate all the tests. Well, I would suggest now deployment is also a block here, right? Because deployment happens after test. Yes. 
And I think it's a reasonable belief that data closer to deployment is going to be more representative of what's actually happening during deployment. So in my assessment, you'll do better by including more recent data in the test set. So I, so yes, it's possible. So I would suspect that the performance on the test set here will perhaps underestimate the performance a little while afterwards. And of course, it could get much worse later. Are you convinced? Sure, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I guess you mentioned that um, it may be necessary to retrain your potential function periodically as data sets change over time. Um, what, when you've deployed something into the wild, is there any standard way of evaluating you know, what what that necessary time interval is, or like okay, great. how often we should update? Great. So. The comment is that things change over time. Uh, some prediction function is deployed into the wild. Maybe it's doing well at first, but things in the world change. So it may stop performing as well. Is there any standard way to, uh, to react to this? So one will be to detect that things have changed. And another is to what do you do about it? Um, I think. I think there's maybe some kind of natural approaches. One would be that you do monitoring. So if it's a scenario where you need a human, a human labeler to actually um, determine what should be happening, you can sample actions or predictions made during deployment, feed them to humans, and have a kind of a constant assessment of how is performance in the wild. And then you could detect a change or a decrease or something like this. Another thing you can do is track kind of the distribution of the inputs, x. And the, we'll come to this in a few slides. But if the, in fact, let's, let's hold off a few minutes. I, let's come back to it. OK. So the concept we're getting at is non-stationarity. So when something that you're modeling changes over time, it's called non-stationarity. And this can come in a few flavors. One is called covariate shift. Covariate shift is when the inputs are training, are changing over time. Um, in particular, maybe they're different between the current deployment state and the, the distribution during input. So covariate, sorry, covariate is another name for input, an input feature. So an example of covariate shift would be, over time, a, a search query, which would be like the input, that was very popular may become less popular and new ones appear, right? So during um, football season, people are making queries related to football. And when the season's over, it switches, those go away. So this is a change in the type of queries that are coming in. It's a change in the input distribution. And it's called covariate shift. And one can monitor that. One can find a way to characterize the distribution of inputs that are coming in and detect changes in the inputs. Um, but that's just on the inputs. Other things can change, too. Concept drift. Concept drift is the input distribution may not change. The correct output changes for any particular input. So what would that be about? So you want to make a recommendation engine. I'm a shopper on a particular website. My interest in winter may be focused on winter coats. After winter, my interest is no longer winter coats. It's it's uh, short sleeve shirts and shorts, OK? So what's interesting to me, so that's what you're trying to predict in this case, has changed, even though I've stayed the same. Now, you could, you could say, all right, well, let's encode the season into the input. Right? Then that would be a way around this type of concept drift. But in general, things in the world change. The correct output for a given input may not always stay the same. And that's called concept drift. So both of these types of non-stationarities, one has to be on the lookout for. Covariate shift, you theoretically can detect automatically by tracking the distribution of the input. Concept drift, you really need um, some way to assess performance of the deployed prediction function. So on looking at it, some way to monitor it to detect that the performance is, is changing. Yeah. OK, great question.
Any more questions related to this circle of ideas? All right, let's back it up a little bit then. Um, so there's one other kind of, it's an alternative to a train test split. It's called k-folded cross-validation. Um, the idea, the, the relevance of it is, suppose your training, your, your label data set is relatively small. And carving out 20% of the data doesn't feel good for two reasons, potentially. One is, you're losing 20% of your data you want to use for training. Okay. Um, but maybe more importantly is that maybe 20% of your data does not give you a very accurate assessment of performance. Maybe you only have 100 examples. 20% of your data is 20 examples. That may not give you statistically a very precise estimate of performance. So there's this alternative, which is very interesting, called k-fold cross-validation. Just out of curiosity, how many people have heard of k-fold cross-validation or used it? OK, good. So a little more than half the class. Um, OK. So briefly, the idea is you can read this text later if you like. The graphic is easier to go through. You start with your original data set. You partition it into k equal parts, in this case five, five folds. Each color is a different fraction of the data. And you basically build a model five times, for each of the five folds. The first time you build it, you leave out the first fold, fold one, the blue one. And we're left with four folds. We build the model on these four folds. It's the model that's being produced. This is a tree model. We'll come to these in week four. And then given that model built on training data two through five, we test it on this holdout fold, it's called, which is block one, fold one. And we get a performance of this first model on the holdout fold, and that's T1. And notice this, is, this performance measure is a, is a legitimate measure of performance of this model because we're testing it on data that it wasn't trained on. Right? Then we do the same where we keep one through five but leave out two and we test on two, and so on. So every piece of data has served in a test set or a holdout set five time, uh, one time, and it's served in a training set four times. Because you'll see four shows up four times, for instance. All right, so what we're left with is five models, and more importantly, five measures of performance. The measures of performance are going to have some variation. And what we do to summarize it is we take the mean of the performance measures across the five folds. And then we can look at the standard error of that estimate. How many of you are from, recall standard error? Could you compute standard error? OK. Some good, good fraction of you. Uh, this is important enough. We'll throw this onto the, uh, the first lab or homework session to walk you through computing these things, just to make sure it's fresh and familiar. OK. So this is what you can do if you have a small data set. Um, uh, but I, I discourage using it as a default. What, what are some issues with k-fold cross-validation? OK, which model do you use? Good question. But for the, um, and it's not answered here either, for the use case of our test set, we don't have to use any of them. Remember, the test set is primarily to say, what is the performance of the model? Of, let me clarify. What is the, well, when I originally pre presented test set, it was intended to evaluate the performance of a prediction function. In this case, there's a subtle difference. What we're really evaluating is the performance of a model building procedure on a fixed set of data. So we've used the same model building procedure five times, and we got five resulting performance measures. And so the, the intent is that the average of these performance measures is going to be a good estimate of what would happen if we took the same model building procedure and applied it to a new set of data of this size. And so what would we actually do after we have our, we have our model building procedure, we have this set of data, we've done that K-full cross validation. We've come up with a performance mean plus or minus some standard error. What do we do? We're ready to, it's, it's the estimate, it exceeds performance requirements. What's the next step? Yeah, retrain on all the data. And the, 
what we believe is that the performance of being the same model of training procedure trained on all the data will be at least as good as the performance we got on average from the from the five-fold cross validation from our cross validation estimate of performance. So, yeah. So you use, use the same idea with the other and when you get the first model, you and in the first step, right? And then you train it and then you test it and you get some performance measure. Uh, do you take that as a starting point for creating the next model with the with the remaining the other uh, K folds uh, you know, where you avoid the second fold and so on and so forth? As in, do you use the uh, performance of the, do you use the algorithm you use for creating the first model as a starting point for the second algorithm, as a second iteration, and so on and so forth? Sorry, so the question I'm hearing is, so we have an algorithm. This is a black box machine learning algorithm that takes data as input and produces a prediction function. We take that same black box and apply it here, 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 and here, five times. Okay, you don't update the black box. Uh... No, the black box stays exactly the same for all five of these things. Yeah. Yeah, this is what we're, you might be anticipating the next step, which is searching for a good model building procedure. We're not there yet. Everything we've spoken about so far is we have one fixed model building procedure, and we're trying to assess how well it will perform when we repeat the same thing in a, in a train deploy scenario. Uh, so what I understood is that the basic purpose of this is to come up with the performance metric, uh, what a uh, like good model would be. So I still don't understand how do you pick up the final model that will be deployed out of this. OK, so the question is, uh, if this whole setup is to get an estimate of how good the model will perform when we apply the same model building procedure to this amount of data. You're saying, all right, what do we actually do? And we want, okay, what we actually do is we take this model building procedure that we have assessed and come up with some estimate of performance. We apply the same model building procedure to the whole set of data. So when you say model building procedure and we apply, to, we take the whole set of data, we do tune parameters of the model, right? The procedure is same, but like, I mean, how do we, like, the ultimate, the, the, the ultimate end goal, uh, the end model that we deploy is, should be different from the model that we deploy? Yeah, the ultimate model you deploy is, is not one of these five. You take the same model building procedure. It's a black box. There's nothing, to, there's nothing that we're tuning on it right now. It's the same black box for all five of these things. We're taking the same thing, and then instead of feeding in these four blocks of data, we're feeding in all five. And then we get a prediction function that we deploy. We can do cross validation for time series, inspired in the same way as we did cross validation, uh, train test or cross validation. So you can it's called uh, forward chaining, where you take your original data and you make a split into train and test. You have your test set of a of a fixed size, fixed uh, window, and you basically choose, in this case, four different time splits, T1, 2, 3, and 4. And for each split, everything to the left is training, and the fixed window to the right is test, and you make sure these test sets don't overlap. And again, you could average your performance across these four um, folds to get your performance estimate. It's a little trickier. Slightly different, right? Because yeah. the number of samples. Yeah, you, you 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 rightly have some concern that well, the training data is a lot bigger for some of these than others, and yeah, these are all things one must ponder and decide the significance and the and the importance of it and the relevance of it. But in some sense, this is the default go-to approach. You could do you you know you could take a fixed window of the history of training data. If you're concerned about that, there's things you can do, but this is the general structure. Yeah. So in both these cases and the previous slides, these are basically a repetition of the previous 80-20 um, way to do it. Can we say that in terms of, uh, of course, the cost is uh, to evaluate is time, more time consuming, but in general, the performance is better. The, the validation, you know, the so this is always preferred and the, AD20 um, procedure. If the uh, the time consumed to do this whole process is not the same. So the question is, 
First, the comment is, is, is well made that k-fold cross-validation takes longer to run. You have to build k models instead of just one. Question is, if time is not an issue, is k-fold cross-validation always better to do? I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to take a depth. It's a good question. Uh, I want to say yes, which is also your intuition, but um, cross-validation from a theoretical perspective is, is not simplistic uh, because of the ideas that we were saying. Like the, there's an overlap in, in the training sets, and so these are not independent, and theory on cross-validation is, is not easy. Theory on train test split is, is fairly simple. So I'm hesitant to say yes, it's definitely better, but I have your intuition as well. Is it the standard practice that for every model generation that first we do the train test split, like 80, 20, or whatever, get the performance measure of that, and then we do the k-fold validation, and then see, okay, which one is better, and then choose that particular uh, model? No. Uh, so you're talking about model choice. I'm not to model choice yet, but I'm about to get there. Okay. So everything so far is for a single model. The goal is let's assess if this model has the performance that we want to deploy, and then estimate the performance and then decide whether to deploy or not. Okay. All right, so th this is the question of what should the intern do? The intern received the 80% of the training data, and now the intern can have a free-for-all and come up with a prediction function however he or she wants. Okay, but there should be some method to the madness. So really, the intern needs her own test set to evaluate and compare the performance of lots of, lots of different possible machine learning algorithms. Uh, and so the simplest thing is for the intern to randomly split, the, split her training data into a training subset and a test set. But in this case, we give it a different name. It's called a validation set. So a validation set, um, the validation set is very much like a test set in that it's held out from the training set. But its use is to compare and to choose among lots of possible model building algorithms, lots of possible prediction functions. Um, the test set is only used on the final prediction function or the tri final model learning procedure to assess whether it's good enough to deploy. Okay. Got it. All right, so now, question. Maybe this is getting a little ahead of ourselves, but is there any value in using the approach in the K-fold uh, cross-validation uh, technique to also use that to uh, systematically improve our uh, uh, prediction, uh, to the algorithm that we use to come up with the prediction function? Are you, okay. So I'll say one thing, and if this addresses your question, great. And if not, we'll, we'll iterate again. So maybe what you're suggesting is that Perhaps the intern, instead of splitting into training and validation, can herself do k-fold cross-validation and can use k-fold cross-validation as the way to evaluate many different machine learning algorithms, many different settings of the machine learning algorithms. And then for each of those, you have a k-fold cross-validated estimate of performance. And then you can compare those and choose the one that performs best. Is that clear? So the, the intern can also use cross-validation to help decide among, to evaluate the performance of various different models and then choose among them. Does that address your question? Um, that was not exactly what I was thinking. I was thinking more in the form of, the, when you explained how the k four validation works, that I was thinking, uh, my mind immediately jumped towards uh, an algorithm that I tried to really try to improve, like, you know, steep resistance, things like that. So maybe in the first uh, iteration, you Predict, uh, create a model based on some of the su subset of the data and you have a, a holdout code that you test it with. And then you get maybe some uh, estimate of its performance and then you, you use that perhaps as a starting point. Use what? Use that model? Use that model and the algorithm you use to create that model as a starting point. And then, uh, okay, one sec. So one sec. So the proposal is uh, you've, you, you had to start with your first fold. You use your model building procedure, which is a black box, nothing to tune right now. Okay. You plug in the data, you get a model. All right, and now it seems like you're suggesting to somehow use some information from this first round when you start on your second round. Yeah. 
Um, so the issue with that is that the training data in your first round is different from the training data of your second round. So if you took information from the first round and used it in the second round, that's kind of like cheating because you're putting information in that was extracted from what should be what might be labels for the second fold, which is training data in the first fold. So you need to be very careful to complete keep your folds in, in isolation. So if you do that, then may, perhaps the performance you will get would not necessarily be accurate because you are using information that might help it wrongly get better performance. Yeah, it could. You always have to be careful of what's called leakage, which is where information of um, well. Well, one version is information that should only be in the test set kind of sneaks into the training set. Leakage is actually a little bit different. Yeah. In the intern scenario where you know intern produces a model and I evaluate it, if I reject that model and send it back to the intern, is there some limit to how many times that can happen before you've got that oh. leakage of the test into the effect of the training? Fantastic question. So we have this test set that we're only supposed to use once to get a nice, unbiased estimate of performance. But in practice, the intern may give us a prediction function. We test it. It's lousy. What, you're done? We, we're, we <laughs> canceled the whole project. We've used our test set already. We're out of luck. No. So in practice, of course, we'll produce another one. We test it. And then I guess the worry is, might we be over, are our estimates legitimate? Might we be overfitting the test set or something like that? Great question. Um, the simple answer is that everything's OK, everything's cool, as long as you don't cheat in the following way. As long as you don't examine the performance, you don't examine, you don't look inside the test set and see, oh, my prediction function got this example wrong. If I had made a feature that focused on this particular word more, it probably would have gotten that right. And then you go and you change your machine learning setup to put that feature. As long as you don't, as long as you don't let your model building procedure be influenced by the test set, you're in good shape. Now, OK. Mathematically, um, there's a, the math here is it's called a finite class lemma. And what it tells you about is, um, so as you test more and more things in the test set, there's, you're more and more likely to overfit. And so your confidence interval, kind of the confidence in the performance of the best of, what are you going to do? You're going to test a whole bunch of things in the test set and eventually take the one that's the best, right? So, you're interested in kind of your confidence interval in the performance of the best thing. And if, if you're concerned about overfitting, what you're concerned about really is that it'll look like the best, but it's really not the best. And that kind of corresponds to your confidence interval and performance is too big. And the size of the confidence interval grows with the logarithm of the number of things you're testing proportionally. Um, to be fair, for that analysis, you need to, in advance, write down all the possible um, models that you're going to be trying on the test set. Uh, so it would be a different analysis for like more fine-tuned stuff. But kind of the, the practical implication is that it's cool. Just don't look at your, if you don't look at the test data, you're not examining too carefully what went awry and designing things to fix the mistakes, you're safe. Yeah. So like, great question, subtle question. If anyone wants to dive into the math as like a side project, let's talk. Good. We can make a work. We can make a, a, a handout on this. Okay. So the the first major problem we've been talking about, the, one of the major problems we've been talking about today, is this potential discrepancy between train test and train deploy. So we're going to drill into a few of those. We've already drilled into a few of them. We're going to do a, a couple more. So leakage is a very interesting one. So leakage is when information from the label, from the output, the desired output, sneaks in inadvertently to the input, into the features. Um, 
and in a, situ in a way that would never happen in deployment. So uh, it gives you kind of the model identifies maybe the wrong thing, and you get a false sense of how well it's doing. So examples, you, you want to do a image recognition problem. You want to decide whether or not there's a cat in a photo, but um, somehow the title of the photo or the page got entered in as a feature. And when you deploy it, you're not going to have that title as an input. Okay. So this would be leakage, where information about the label kind of leaked into the feature set. Um, another one would be you have these uh, sales leads, and you have characterization of you know, different things about, say, a customer or the, or the scenario. But of course, you have kind of labeled data, which includes the outcome of uh, a pitch or something. Did the person sign on? Did they, did, did, did they convert to a sale? And um, you might include as a feature, um, you might include as information re relevant to that input, the sales commission. For, that's some fraction of how big the sale was. But of course, you don't want to include sales commission as an input feature. You're not trying to, you're not trying to predict sales commission directly, right? You're trying to predict whether or not there was a sale. But if sales commission is non-zero, that means there was a sale. So this is leakage of information. That should not be part of your inputs. Um, that's maybe an obvious one. A, a less, slightly less obvious one I've seen before is um, doing sentiment prediction on Yelp reviews. So you have the text of a Yelp review, and you want to predict was this generally positive or negative sentiment uh, opinion about whatever they're reviewing. And you can have human labelers go through and say positive, positive, negative, positive, negative, et cetera. Um, but also, there's a star rating that the user may have clicked off for that item. And of course, that's going to indicate overall whether they were having positive or negative feelings about it. So if the star rating leaks in as input, that's leakage. Because you, you want to be able to derive the answer from the text, not from the star rating. So leakage just can be more subtle than these examples, so it's something to keep an eye out for. Um, sample bias, I have definitely touched on this. I don't think I've used the term yet. Sample bias is when the selection of data used in, in your test is different from the selection of the data that you'll see in deployment. Right? Some mismatch between your test set and your deployment set. Um, we have the same thing if we could have the same thing between training and test, for example. Uh, some quick examples. You, know, you want to make a model of US voting patterns. You want to predict an election or something. But your information source is phone surveys done to landlines. So what's the bias there? Well, I mean, the people who have landlines these days is not a random subset of the population, right? Maybe it's more homeowners or people. Well, I don't want to generalize, but I think we can all agree that the people who have landlines is not a random subset of the population. So there's a bias. Uh, stock forecasting model, time series prediction. Uh, we create our labeled, we create our training set by we go to um, the list of companies on the exchange, and we choose a random subset of, I don't know, a thousand of them. And then we go back in history and get the time series. Um, so what could be an issue with this? Yeah? Survivorship bias. Survivorship bias, yes. So um, the one thing we're going to know as we train and test on this data set is that none of these companies are going to disappear, are going to go bankrupt. They're going to fall off the exchange because of the way we chose. But this is not something that you will know at deploy time. At deploy time, a company may show up to your prediction function, and it may well disappear in three days. And this was never the case in our trained test scenario because of the way we chose our companies. We chose them because they're existing at the end of the whole period. Yeah, survivorship bias. All right. All right, so I think we've done a pretty good job of of reviewing the, the major ways that we could have discrepancies between the train test and the train deploy scenarios. And now we're going to dig into what is perhaps the 
fundamental issue of machine learning that happens inside the black box. Okay. Um, or at least it's very related to, it's more related to the inside of the black box. Okay. It's called overfitting. Let's start with a toy example. Here's some data. What's our, this is a prediction problem. Our input is some point on the x-axis between 0 and 1. The output that we're trying to predict is some number represented on the y-axis, or t-axis here. Um, so what kind of machine learning problem is this? Regression, yes, because we're predicting a number. Right. Now, in this scenario, we have this uh, not realistic scenario, situation where we know we don't, we, this is artificial data, so it was generated by creating this green curve, sine wave, and adding some random noise to it. So each of these blue points is the green, the, the kind of unnoisy version with some noise added to it. That's how we got these five examples. Okay. So the input is the x position and the output is the y position. We're trying to come up with a prediction function that takes a number and produces a number. All right, we're going to fit this with a polynomial. I chose polynomials because I think you guys We'll be very familiar with polynomials from your algebra days. This is a polynomial prediction function. Uh, the input is x. To make this an actual function, we, of course, have to assign numbers to all the w's. Those w's are called parameters. It's called the, the parameter. It's the param those are the parameters of this function, this prediction function. OK, f of x is a prediction function. So. If our goal is to fit this polynomial, you can imagine there's a learning function, a machine learning algorithm, if you will, a simple one, called fit polynomial. It takes that input data, training data, label training data, and also an integer m. Remember what m was? m is the order of the polynomial. It's the, it's the highest exponent of x. So we tell this function the order of the polynomial, and we give it the data, and it will return this array of doubles, this vector of doubles. Um, and what will this vector, what information will this vector have in it? The, the parameter estimates. It'll tell you these, these will be the w's. So what's the length of this double vector? m plus 1, right? Great, so this is the function that does the learning. OK, returns the array of parameters. and. On the other, in the other direction, given the parameters and m, we can make the prediction function. Predict polynomial. You could plug in the parameter vector w, the integer m, which is the degree, and it takes the input x, and it'll return a double, which is the prediction we want to make. Clear? So this would be the signature. This could be a signature of a prediction function. So in this case, fit polynomial produced a vector of parameters. More generically, you could imagine a learning algorithm could produce a function itself. It could produce in C++, maybe it returns a pointer to a function, right? It's, it's, re it's returning something that you can use to do your predictions. OK. So the learning algorithm takes your input and produces, yes, your parameter estimates, the best w's it can find. But the learning algorithm itself has a parameter, doesn't it? Which is m, the degree of the polynomial. So a parameter of the learning algorithm is called a hyperparameter. And the hyperparameters are usually set by the data scientist. We get to decide the hyperparameters. Usually we try a whole bunch of them. We test the performance of all of them on our validation set. We find the best one, and that's the procedure. Um, sometimes you can use a machine learning algorithm to choose your hyperparameters for you. That's interesting. It's a recent topic. Okay. So let's do some polynomial fitting on this data. m equals 0. It's a flat line that fits the data rather poorly. That's called underfitting, not fitting the data well enough. It's underfitting. Let's raise the degree. 1, it's a line. Still not so great. Underfit. Degree three, good, bad, what do you think? 
Not bad. Only for the day. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. So, a distinction is made. It seems to fit this data pretty well, but this doesn't say anything about what happens for new data, one. And two, what the point you're actually making is for data that maybe extends beyond. Maybe it does really poorly out here. Kind of it. Right. So, um, if that's the case, we have a situation, don't we, where the, suppose this is test data, for simplicity, where the test data doesn't represent the deployment data. Because if we are going to get points out here at deployment, we should have seen them in test, or else it's a, it's a bad model for test deploy. So, yeah, we hope that the data we're seeing during training is a good representative of the data we see during test, or a whole bunch of machine learning is out of luck. Yeah. So decent, I think. Uh, we'll try nine, and yeah, so it fits perfect, but our hunch is it's going to be lousy on new data. And since we know the true prediction function, we know it's it's nothing like the green. So this is not good. This is called overfitting. If we give it new data, new random data, it's going to do very poorly on validation or on test. Okay. So M controls the model complexity and General complexity is the term that is used a lot. Um, visually, you could think of more complex functions. They, they're more squiggly. They can bounce around more. Generally, they're more able to fit noisy data exactly. Um, and as has been pointed out, fitting the train data does not really indicate that you're going to do well on test data. So. There's some, you need some kind of a balance between uh, the complexity of your model and how well you fit the training data. So there's this term overfitting. Uh, I don't think there's any single precise definition of overfitting. People use it in a little bit different, in various ways. But generally it means um, training performance is good, test performance is not so good. Right? There's some gap. And moreover, I think underlying it is the idea that if you didn't allow your prediction function to be so complex, if you constrained it to be simpler, you might have done better on test. And so if, if you have an overfitting situation, the first, one of the first remedies is try to reduce the complexity of the model that you're using. So in our case, it would be decrease m. Use a smaller order polynomial. Um, another thing you could do is get more training data. If training data is cheap, always go for more training data. This is usually your, your go-to. So what happens in our scenario? So we're stuck at 90 degree polynomial, which was really overfitting on 10 points, but now we have 15. It's not so bad. Maybe it's still a little bit overfitting. Um, with 100 data points, nails it, right? So this complex model was overfitting terribly on 10 data points, but is quite good on 100 data points. So there's a, a trade-off between the complexity of the model that you can use and the amount of training data that you have. We're going to dive into this a lot more next week when we get more theoretical. Yeah? Wouldn't another element be that like, when presenting this model to some like, business stakeholder, you should have to explain like, intuitively why a ninth order polynomial makes sense with respect to some input? So, so like this nails it and fit, right? But it's like I, I can't think of really many things I can hold in my brain that makes sense at next to the number. All right. So the question is, isn't another issue with this ninth order polynomial that we're never going to be able to convince someone that this model makes sense? Ah, yes, probably. This is a problem that's pervasive in machine learning methods. Uh, there are some methods that we tell ourselves are interpretable. Linear methods, small trees, uh, not too many. Uh, it's an active area of research to try to find a way to take a potentially very complicated model and distill it into human digestible, intuitive explanations for what it's doing. Um, uh, maybe we can talk about that more sometime. Uh, I had a small observation. So I guess one, uh, one thing I was thinking about is that the 
the degree of the parameters we were choosing, nine parameters, nine parameters were just 10 data points. So given that the data, the data set is so close to the number of parameters we were looking for, uh, it's pro so that might be a very good idea of that might be from a problem. Okay. Whereas if you have much worse figure data set, so the intuition you're expressing is that can't we look at the number of parameters, the number, the number of data points, and just see if, they're, if the number of parameters is more than the number of data points or very close to the number of data points, that's, that's a bad thing. And, um, and if the number of data points is much more than the number of parameters, we're in good shape. And what I would like to say to that is that's very much a uh, intuition from methods from statistics like um, basic linear regression and uh, maybe trees and these sorts of things but most modern machine learning methods have uh, very nice ways to control the complexity of the model even while keeping too many parameters so it's not at all uncommon to have uh, far more parameters than you have data points and still have a very good model fit. Um, but you have to find another way to control the complexity of your model besides just the number of parameters that you have. And we'll definitely talk about that in two weeks in great detail. Uh, it's called regularization, is the basic concept that's used to control the model complexity. Very, very important. Yeah. I think deep learning is kind of interesting in this kind of complexity because it tends to be very, very com complex model. Where people who do the deep learning network tend to have thousands or millions of parameters. The user, even with their, <coughs> I'm sorry, even with their small, mid sized data set. So it tends to be easily get over there, right? Because now your model is, is, is huge, it's very complex. And your data set is normally not, not too big. So um, I think the idea is that uh, you can build your model, build your complex model, but with strong regularization to make the model not so complex. So you're s saying that uh, deep learning models are one example of a scenario where the number of parameters that you have potentially greatly exceeds the number of examples that you have? It can. It can. And yet performance seems to be good when all the tricks are applied and these sorts of things. Yeah, um, neural networks are actually quite a mystery, uh, frankly, as to why they work as well as they do. There's a lot of theory that explains the performance, the, how the regularization helps uh, things perform well, even when you have too many parameters, more parameters than the, than the number of data points. But interestingly, those explanations don't apply so well to the neural networks, and so, uh, there is definitely a mystery still on why, how it is that neural networks manage to do so well when, for other reasons, you might think they would overfit. So, almost every machine learning algorithm has a hyperparameter or multiple hyperparameters. Uh, they come in some different flavors, and um, you get to tune them all. Uh, some of them control the model complexity, that one we've spoken about. Some of them determine the type of model complexity control, which we haven't spoken about at all, things like L1 and L2 regularization. Uh, sometimes the optimization algorithm that's used to select the model, to select the prediction function, uh, can be adjusted. Things like learning rates. Um, the type of model that you're using, the loss function that you're using, we've talked about that, kernel type, um, that's yet another type of hyperparameter. We're gonna go deeply into all of these things during the course. But for now, you can treat them as knobs that you could adjust blindly. And with enough compute power, you could do some random search across this space of hyperparameters to fit your model. Um, it's not that crazy to do this sort of thing. But of course, we're going for some deeper understanding to know what all these high parameters actually do. But for this first unit that you'll be doing, when you do kind of end-to-end -end learning, don't be afraid to probe into some models that have 
uh, hyperparameters that you don't entirely understand what they do, experiment a little. See, see what happens. It's fine. You're safe. See, kind of my point is that you're safe just fiddling as long as you're very careful with your setup. As long as you keep your test set, you keep your validation set, you can go crazy in your training set. You can do all sorts of things you don't even understand what you're doing. But as long as you're very rigorous on not looking at your validation data as you train your model, um, not looking at your test set, then you're, you're safe to do this kind of somewhat crazy experimentation. So I have a little summary here of the overall ML workflow through questions. We've already basically set it all. Um, this is not the cross-validation approach, but the, the more, um, what I, I would like to say is the recommended approach, which is split your data into training, validation, and test. In this scenario, when you have plenty of data, you know, live it up a little. Don't bother with k full cross-validation, which takes like k times the computation. Make your validation set as big as you need to get the performance estimate accuracy that you would like to get. Same thing for the test set. If you have plenty of data, you should have um, no real need to, to do k full cross-validation, because you can always get a better performance estimate with larger validation and test data. If you're worried about your training data getting too small, well, maybe you don't have as much data as you think. With a training set that I've been using lately, it takes two weeks to even look at all the data, okay, for the program to process all the data points once. Um, we have way more data than we need. We have a fixed size validation set, a fixed size test set. We're not worried about not having enough training data. So if you're in that scenario, live it up a little. No cross validation. Okay. So repeat the following until you're happy. Work out a feature extraction methodology. Choose some machine learning algorithm. Choose some hyperparameters. Get your prediction functions. Evaluate on your validation set. And then iterate. Go back to features. Try to make new features. Try different hyperparameter settings. Test on your validation set. Do that multiple times until you find a model that you think does well on the validation set. Go ahead and retrain that exact black box model building procedure on the training and validation set combined. And then you get a new prediction function, which you, you are ready to deploy if it's good enough, you run it on your test set, you get your performance estimate, it's as good as it needs to be, go deploy. If it's not, back to the drawing board. Maybe get more data, different possibilities. All right. Questions? In the previous slides, so uh, we have a feature extraction. We have that one, two, and three. Is typical the boundary of that? So, so all this we, is like iterative. Is there a way to automate this whole process as well? Because you mentioned uh, like feature extraction is it's part of the algorithm itself. Because if I can make the raw data, you know, as long as I'm, I make the the size uh, the same to the RD, for example, then all go through, right? Okay. And then also the hyper parameter tuning. That's an iteration that's also optimization. Theoretically, it should also be. Yeah. So the question is, um, can we view the choice of feature extraction methodology, the choice of hyperparameter settings, as an optimization problem in its own right, and do that somehow automatically? And uh, yes. So what you would need to do for feature extraction, for instance, is somehow uh, parameterize that search for features. The, the question is, yeah, definitely we can, we can, we can do that, but is that uh, better than some human-picked features and then human-picked hyperparameters? You know, we, we, can, we can do that, if we can do that automatically, will that be better than the human-picked uh, features and uh, you know, everything you choose, one, one, two, three? Okay, so the question is, uh, is something automatic, will that be better than something done by a human? And well, <laughs> human done it so. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a, I think that, I think the answer is that depends on two things. How good is the human? How good is your optimization algorithm? 
people are trying to make this hyperparameter tuning, uh, those hyperparameter tuning algorithms better. Um, that's active area of research. Um, the type of optimization you need to do for hyperparameter tuning is usually a bit different than the, we'll see later in the course that the machine learning algorithm itself is doing an optimization procedure, but the type of optimization is different. Hyperparameters are usually, they're often discrete uh, things to tune. Um, when they have continuous kind of, when the behavior is smooth with respect to hyperparameters settings, you can use some of the similar optimization approaches. Um, I would say that um, humans are still important in this process. There are some domains where the input can be, where it's much easier to parameterize feature extraction in a way that's easy for an optimization algorithm to work with. One really popular example of that is uh, neural networks, for instance, applied to images. So the raw data for an image is a whole bunch of pixels. Suppose there are it's a bunch of pictures that are all the same size. This is already a vector of numbers, a fixed length. Um, features are on an image can be, uh, you know, they're arbitrary functions of the input. And neural networks are essentially learning features by some kind of smooth optimization, kind of optimizing feature functions uh, automatically. It's integrated into the model. You could think of it as being integrated into the model. So in that situation, it's, it's a winner. Neural networks on, on images are, are fantastic. They're the best methods out there right now. Um, but if you go back to uh, kind of the email address situation, it's not as easy to have a kind of a to parameterize all the types of feature extractions that you might want to do. You know, maybe you want to look at, is the first letter, um, well, it depends on the type of string detection you're doing, but you could, there are certain things that are, it's, it's hard to imagine how to write a kind of a smoothly parameterized function that captures all the feature extractions you might want to do. I think humans are still in business for making features. But you can make huge quantities of them, like we were talking with all possible three-letter combinations. And then, then you could do parameter search to select them out. Yeah? So for the second step, the second part, choose some algorithm. Yes. Yeah, for two I had in mind that there's some live machine learning library you're using, it gives you lots of options, and you could choose one. Yeah. This is the black box setting. I mean, later on, it's still, I mean, when you're actually doing this uh, for real, you will probably not have much occasion to code your own machine learning algorithm from scratch. You'd want to use an existing implementation because people spend a lot of time optimizing them, but it will help to understand what's going on, on the inside to know how to to the parameters and how to prepare your data.